Hi everyone, uh, my name is Danielle and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about my dissertation research which is coming to a conclusion where I guess I'll knock on that wood. Uh, I'm almost done um, and what I want to talk about today is um, um, to provide I suppose some of that granularity and that specificity to the conversation that has been um, ongoing so far. Okay. Um, so my dissertation examines how newcomers uh, from the Philippines to Winnipeg who arrive through the provincial nominee program uh, find, use, and share information um, to migrate, settle, and live in Winnipeg. So um, I look uh, quite closely at the relationship between people's information practices, that is, um, the ways that they're finding, evaluating, and using information, and um, the impacts or the relationship between those practices on uh, their settlement, um, specifically um, how they made the decision to migrate, how they prepared to migrate, and how they, and what, what they did once they arrived. Um, my research is uh, quite qualitative in nature. I think, I, no, I do have to move up here. Um, I spoke to 14 newcomers recently arrived from the Philippines, interviewing each of them twice. Each interview lasted several hours. Uh, so what I came away from with then is a very detailed rather than a broad perspective of the migration process for a specific community. And so I want to be clear that this study might not be generalizable to other populations. Uh, I think um, an excellent job has do been done here tonight um, to provide um, an introduction to migration in Manitoba. Um, and so I will only briefly provide some more context about the Filipino community in Manitoba in particular. Uh, as Ben said, the Philippines is the number one source country to Manitoba and has been for the last several years. Um, the great majority of Filipinos to Manitoba now arrive through the provincial nominee program. Um, but it should also be noted that the Filipino community in Winnipeg has been around since the late 1950s um, and it's well established. Uh, it's a um, large and active community and uh, since that time there have been waves of garment workers, healthcare workers and, and lots of folks who have come and migrated um, to Winnipeg from the Philippines. And this population, this already landed population, has played a significant role in the settlement process for the people with whom I uh, spoke. I don't know if that is readable. Um, but I'm not going to go through it all. I, I'm, I use it um, to, to provide you um, a sense of the people uh, with whom I spoke. I want to give you some basic information, um, including a really brief overview of their settlement trajectories. So I won't go through the whole table. The thing I'll say about the table is when you see that there are two colors that are the same, those folks are married. So I ended up interviewing uh, six married couples, which wasn't my intention. Uh, but the result was that I, I spent, I got a really um, close view of a sort of family's um, migration experience. Uh, all of the interviews were conducted in 2012 and all participants had lived in Winnipeg between one and four years. Now the people in this study were a very homogenous group and this is largely due to the structure of the provincial nominee program and the way that points are awarded. Um, consequently, many of the people in this study um, have similar settlement experiences. All participants came as skilled workers through what was formerly called the family stream or the general stream, um, and I think it's now called the Manitoba experience category. And what this meant is that they either had immediate family or at least two friends or distance relatives that agreed to be their supporters. Um, and Ben talked a little bit about this program um, earlier. And I think that there are, um, well, I'll go on to talk about some of the implications of the relationship between Manitoba supporters and the participants in this study, because that relationship becomes very um, entrenched, and those people become de facto um, information resources that are heavily, heavily relied upon. Um, in terms of the education of 
this of uh, my participants, um, all but one had university education. These folks were often in the middle of successful careers when they left the Philippines. Uh, and when they arrived, all but one person took a so-called survival job. And the, the language of survival job is not mine. Um, it was used um, in, in my interviews. Um, and they worked in jobs like fast food, retail, or factories. So it um, took participants who were looking for work between two weeks and four months to find their first job. Um, from there, most continued working in this position until they were able to find work more closely aligned to their fields. Uh, and often this was a difficult, um, stressful, emotional, and um, exhausting process. Um, it was not easy to um, have a full-time job, have a young family, and to find work or to uh, retrain in another field so that one could work in their field. Uh, so currently five were, are working in their field, and again, this was in 2012. Uh, two have retrained, and one is at home with her children. And then the rest are um, looking to work in their field still. I was a little overzealous with the slides, so I'm gonna skip that one. Um, and in my study, what I did um, was to understand the relationship between participant settlement process and their information practices. I identified various phases in their settlement trajectories and then identified um, information needs or the questions that they had and the resources or the people and places that they went um, to address these questions within each phase. Um, these phases are largely sequential, but certainly many activities occur across the entire migration process. So, I, and I did this twice. I, I talked to the first interviews that I um, did with people, I talked to them about the information needs that they had before they left the Philippines, and then um, the information needs and their, uh, related to their settlement and arrival experiences. I, I don't want to uh, focus too much on the information needs before arrival, um, except to say, well, you can see that there, there are um, there are significant there are significant and many different kinds of needs that um, respondents had. They had questions about um, sort of general life questions, like what will life be like there? What will I do there? And then they had really specific questions relating to applying to the provincial nominee program, collecting documentation, and um, um, filling out forms. As well, they had questions about, um, really specific questions about what would life would be like. How do I get a job? How do I get a driver's license? Those kinds of questions. So there was a wide array of questions. But what surprised me about um, these Set, this set of interviews were not the wide array of questions, but rather the narrow um, way by which people sought answers to these questions. Uh, so I was surprised that although there were many questions, especially about employment, respondents in this study did very little um, information searching. Um, instead, um, they they relied very heavily on the advice that they received from other migrants. So people, particularly people who had come to Winnipeg, but also others who had gone to the US or to Australia or other places, those, um, that advice really, really mattered. And another thing that was um, quite important were the stories, other people's migration stories. So the respondents that I spoke to used these stories as a way to assess um, how they would do once they arrived and, and what they thought that they needed to do once they arrived. Um, so these, these stories and advice from other migrants um, became the primary information resources. And one of the reasons that I was surprised about this was because there is a whole um, industry of pre-migration information available to migrants um, coming to Manitoba. And largely this wasn't um, used, except of course when they were filling out the application applications. So this leads me to, I guess, what I would, what I think is um, an important piece of, an important finding for me in my study. Um, respondents had really particular expectations about arrival before they came, um, and their their pre-migration their pre-departure information practices, specifically their reliance 
and the trust they had uh, with their friends and family who had already migrated and the, the privileging of stories, etc., resulted in participants arriving thinking that they knew what life in Winnipeg was life, what, what life in Winnipeg was like. And they had a real they had really specific ideas about what arrival would look like. And then they had this sense that um, Winnipeg is a place for a better life. It is an opportunity for my family. So there was a real assumption that Winnipeg was um, was better. And um, these high expectations were not always met once people arrived, particularly um, when they are immediately after they arrived. Another aspect to this was they arrived with a very clear idea about um, the steps that they needed to take to settle. Um, a big piece of this had to do around employment and um, this notion of survival work. So one person said, uh, my sister told me not to be picky. I know I need to take a survival job, I am prepared for that. They arrived expecting to um, take those retail jobs or the fast food jobs and then uh, work their way up to something in their field. Another important consideration here is that we weren't worried. My sister can help us with the housing and finding a job and the other things. Um, they expected to be supported um, upon arrival by their Manitoba supporters and the other folks that they knew in Winnipeg and often they knew lots of people in Winnipeg and they were. Um, so these expectations affected their settlement practices once arrived. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about information needs upon arrival. And I'm going to do this way faster than I thought I would. Um, so I, I divided this or I divided this time period, which was short, it's between one and four years, so it's really the tip of the iceberg in terms of settlement again into two or into four phases, arrival and orientation. These are the very first few days after arrival. And during this period, um, people are quite disoriented. They, they came thinking they knew uh, what life was going to be like, what the city was going to be like. Um, and this was extremely disorienting. Arrival was extremely disorienting to them. Um, their impressions were often not what their experiences were. Um, the next stage is getting started, and this this phase really takes it goes over a few months. This is the the period of getting that first job and uh, moving into an apartment because all of the people in this study moved in with their uh, Manitoba supporters. Those those folks were instrumental in providing um, the basic needs for people when they arrived, and they also provided a ton of information about things like how to find a job uh, job references uh, where to go, how to buy a car, um, how to find an apartment. Um, this was a difficult time for uh, newcomers. They had lots of self-doubt and second thoughts. They thought they were coming uh, for a better life and often the initial experiences didn't um, reflect what their expectations were. As well, they had lots of questions. They had lots of problems that they needed to solve and they didn't have the um, information finding skills or an understanding of the information landscape, particularly the settlement sector or the employment sector that allowed them to accomplish these tasks. So mostly they used um, the, their Manitoba supporters to help them find information in this time and they also uh, used online sites like um, job banks <coughs> to uh, find work. Okay, um, and then the third phase, and I'll skip the last one, is the phase of building a better life. Again, this was an important consideration or an important motivator. Um, this is one of the reasons why people often cited that they wanted to come to Winnipeg. Um, and so in this phase, participants are trying to meet the goals that they've set up for themselves um, for this better life. And this includes finding a career job, um, upgrading their education, buying a house, and very importantly, bringing other, others from the Philippines to, through the provincial nominee program. So um, sort of building that Filipino community in Winnipeg was a, a key part of this process. And um, in terms of information finding or information sources, um, in this, at this point it, in arrival, uh, respondents were able to use a greater variety of resources, um, especially 
when it came to uh, employment and retraining. So not all respondents hooked into the um, settlement sector. Some were told that they didn't need the settlement sector by their uh, family and friends, but those that did really, um, at this point, were able to avail themselves of a whole host of really useful services that, that enabled um, them to hook themselves into um, retraining options. Um, uh, education and um, job referrals that they were then able to use to find um, work that was more meaningful to them. And uh, I'm just going to not conclude with my concluding thoughts, but to say thank you very much. <laughs>